Hey folks, this is Rabble Rouse and Rich Bergeron. It's the Tornado Tony Pennico. And Psychic Tom Padgett with his crystal ball ready to go. Um, yep, and we got lots of stuff to cover. We got two UFC cards. Uh, we got some boxing stories and uh, events to cover. Um, actually watched hey, some... Um, friend of mine watched the UFC said uh, the decision wasn't too good. Yeah, a couple of them were, were controversial. Uh, just so happened to be the ones I didn't see. <laughs> uh, but I did hear a lot about them. And um, I think Tom and I did pretty good on our predictions <clears throat> from the week before. Yep. Uh, we pretty much got the whole card. <laughs> so that, that wasn't a problem. But uh, just it was closer than we thought it would be. And especially the Holloway fight. Uh, even Dana White came out and said uh, Max Holloway won that, which is, you know, kind of crazy. Um, but the first story I'm going to talk about tonight is from another league, but former UFC fighter. And a guy who probably didn't, couldn't have deserved uh, a knockout loss more. <laughs> uh, you might remember this guy from being kicked out of Bellator for holding on to submissions too long. A guy named Rusmar Palhares. And uh, he had a match against Michael Materia the other night, uh, last week. Uh, and uh, well, actually, this says it's from 2016. Okay, sorry about that. But um, for some reason, this was going viral this week. Uh, but yeah, this was uh, unreal. It was about an uppercut, because uh, basically the fight was going into, I believe, the third round. And just out of nowhere, uppercut right to the chin. Usamar Palhares fell into a freaking ball of crap, basically. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I don't know why this... Yeah, I haven't heard of him in years now. So, you yeah. say this was uh, 2020, it was 2016, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael Materla. I don't know why they're showing showing this now as it's like news. But yeah, it's a story on fanbuzz.com and it's worth worth watching. Uh, the knockout just crumples them. But it reminds me also of a thing going around Facebook about the masks. You know, you got to wear masks everywhere now. So, uh, of course, you have the crowd that says masks are good. You Everybody should wear them, and there's no problems with them, and no health effects whatsoever from wearing them 24 hours a day. Uh, and then you have the camp, fuck you, I'm not wearing a mask. You tell me to wear a mask, I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> so there's a thing going around Facebook that says, before you tell me that I need to be wearing a mask, you should ask yourself one question. Does the mask I'm wearing protect me from an uppercut? <laughs> so, yeah, I thought that was pretty good. Pretty clever. So that was the one, the one, the one post on that. Was it you that posted that? No, I didn't post that. No, oh, somebody actually posted that. I was like, I was laughing at it. No, I, I might have shared it, but I saw it on okay, somebody okay, else's. Okay, maybe that's what I saw that. Uh, but it's for boxing. This has had a real big ad blitz. You guys might have seen it actually yourselves the last couple of days, but um, I ran into it in a couple places, so I figured I'd mention it. Uh, something called Light Boxer. L I T E Boxer. Uh, not to be confused with Miller Light. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's just like it sounds it lights up, and then you punch it. And, uh, it's, to me, it seems all right, except for the fact that it's very flat, one-dimensional, and I'm not sure where the hooks and the uppercuts will come in, but if you're doing, if you're going to practice your one-two punching game, I guess it's great, but it looks like there's six different lights, and they're all on the front of it from the video that I watched, uh, but there's some big money behind this, um, it's co-founded by a couple of guys, uh, Jeff Morin and Todd Dagris. And um, they're not really boxing professionals, I don't think. 
Uh, their co-founder and general partner at Spark. Oh, one of them is a co-founder and general partner at Spark Capital. That's Dagris. And uh, he came up with the idea. And he, that was basically after he started training in a gym with, uh, with a, a trainer. Uh, and he had a problem replicating that workout at home with a heavy bag because it was boring. And get this. It was just a dismal experience for me, he said. It was so boring. If I could get myself to do it, it was a good cardio workout. It was just tedious and unpleasant. The bag is just sitting there, and it's not doing anything to you. So you kind of feel guilty punching it. I don't think I've ever felt guilty. Well, I feel guilty punching it. Yeah, punching um, my back. You know what's just funny, Rich? It's like um, one girl I know, and I, she is, she used to go to a fitness center I used to train at like 15 years ago, and I used to teach some boxing instruction there. So like everybody knew who I was because, you know, I announced who I am when I walk into places, for one. And the other thing was like on certain nights, I'd always be in there doing the bag workouts, and I'd be training people, and, and um, so – a couple of years ago were Facebook friends and she had sent me like oh check this thing out it looks pretty cool and it was similar to that and it was like you know like a thing where like you can <laughs> you guess you just liked one of my comments the very same girl like <laughs> literally right now <laughs> um, but it was, it was like one of those like punching things but it was like more like like almost like tapping like Tap, 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 You know, it was like something you really couldn't really tear into. And, yeah. and when I do, you know, box and water workouts, part of the reason I like my water bag is you can, you know, do a variety where sometimes you can sit there and you can do speed, movement. You're right. It doesn't feel like a fancy light up or movement or, you know, instructional stuff. And, okay, so certain people might not like that. But at the same time, I'm... This is something you can sit down, you can really sit down on your ass and really tear into it and say, like, you know, you know and really like, go all out. Right. But like, a lot of these light things, it's more like, to, to be honest, it's, it's not realistic. Right. It, it's almost like a game, like a video game where you're just punching. Right. Well, this actually is geared towards more of the non-boxer, I think, because the guy who created it is just obviously doing it for fitness. He's not doing it for competition. Uh, right, right. So, they're actually going for the home market, uh, not the gym market, I think. Uh, which is probably and you know what? good and, and to, and to for the trend, because there's a big trend. You know, but. I understand that you do like that, you know, rat attack stuff, but I... Personally, and maybe it's because of my background, I feel that you get a better workout. But, and, and remember, because I've been doing it so long, you know. Well, you are your own trainer, too. Like, this is for people that know nothing about training. boxing. We, we know, you know, what we're <coughs> doing. We have other people that don't know what they're doing. They just rap, have stuff, and it's instructing them what to do. Hit this twice. Hit this three times. Left, right, left. And, yeah. and, okay, maybe they are getting something decent out of it. For someone like me, I'm like, no, bullshit. I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to get a better workout by maybe not doing the three- and four-punch ratatats, but you yeah, know, I think my the own only, combination my own movement. The you only know, thing that might appeal to you, footwork. Tony, on this one is that it offers the ability to challenge friends to the same workout as you, allowing you to see the results side by side. But, uh, yeah, that's probably the only thing that's good about it for us. Uh, it costs $1,500. <laughs> the, the thing that I'm going to go back to is, you know, to, to do something like this, you're forced to stand still, right? Well, you're, then you're losing half of your body, you know, because a great work on what I did, there was when I'm working the bag and I'm working around it because I'm getting a lot of footwork in and I'm getting lateral yeah. movement in. Not yeah, only are you forced to stand still, but I'm looking at the picture of this thing right now, and it, it, it comes with the most tiny mat that weighs yeah. the thing down that you could possibly think of. I mean, you probably get two steps to the left and two steps to the right if you're lucky. Uh, that's it. Yeah, no, that doesn't work. 
And it's a big gap from, you know, stepping off it to the floor. Looks like two or three inches minimum. So, yeah. Not very practical like for said, us professionals. Dude, you guys, you guys know me, and you guys know my personality. And this is long, like, well, obviously, I, I knew Rich without knowing Rich at this time. Um, but back when I was at my one job, we went to, um, like, we had our company picnic, but since we didn't have a, a property anymore, we just went to, down to, um, and I don't know if they're nationwide, I know we have some in Philly, but it's called Dave and Buster's. It's like a big arcade bar for adults. Right. Pretty cool. I've seen it. And we were, I was about maybe 29 when we went there. It was back in 2005, I believe. Yeah, it was 2005. So we go there, and they had this box. I'm like, this looks cool. Okay. And you, you grab your little paddles, and you say you have the opponent, but it's making you stand with your feet next to each other. And I'm like, I can't do this. That's wrong. And I'm trying to do, like, the Philly, the, the Philly shell, you know, to, and they're like, no, you just got hit. I'm like, the oh, fuck, I did. <laughs> and then I'm throwing triple jabs and stuff, but the, the computer couldn't pick it up. So it was like, you didn't land them. I'm like, get the hell out of here. And I'm doing, like, double jab right hand, and it's like, left hook, and the computer could not recognize that's what I was doing. And then it would say, oh, my God, you stunned your opponent. You have to throw, like, 30 punches in, like, a 30-second span. And most people who were just moving their hands back and forth like little, you know, two or three inch motions to count for a punch. Not me. Hmm. I'm throwing, like, I'm in a fight and I, I got the guy on the ropes. I'm throwing like Sugar A. Leonard with Tommy Hearns on the ropes in mm-hmm. the 14th ramp. I'm pouring sweat. I got my coworkers looking at me like I'm an idiot. All the wind, basically like a whistle. <laughs> nice. You know, but I'm looking, I'm looking and I'm like, no, the machine is wrong. The machine <laughs> Cannot cannot calculate my natural hand speed, and its positioning is wrong. I said this is nonsense. <laughs> can't calculate my defense. Yeah. Like fuck that. Well, anyway, if if you wanted this thing, which is a big if, you'd have to pay fifteen hundred dollars for the unit itself, and then for your subscription to the service, it's twenty nine dollars a month. You can get expert guided boxing lessons. From who we don't know. There's no names included here to say that it's anybody big. And uh, get this, all right? They got the video of this thing. That's the commercial for it. You can barely see what the rig looks like because the entire thing is in like barely lightable background, barely lit background. It's like in a, a warehouse at dusk. <laughs> it, you see, literally, like one flash of light on the unit. Everything else is shot in darkness, so you can see the lights. So are you trying to tell me that we have to work out in the dark on this thing? Because <laughs> that's not too bright to get my drift. Uh, but, yeah, they're trying to capitalize on the Peloton hype, which was basically destroyed last year. It was doing very well, and then last year they were getting ready to do an IPO. Supposedly everything was good, and they just started tanking. Uh, so it's not as popular as it used to. You don't even see the Peloton commercials anymore. I remember last Christmas, it was like psh, every other commercial was Peloton this, Peloton that. Now you don't even see the commercials. <clears throat> so I don't know why these guys think think they're going to do better than the Peloton brand with a smaller sport, you know. Just about everybody has ridden a bike before, but not everybody's boxed before. So, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be successful. And then add to it the fact that it's not practical for even a regular boxer. We'll see. But it's being hyped. It's, the hype well, is well, out there. It reminded me when I was in Vegas last year and they had that smart bag. Yeah. And, yeah, it was cool because, like I said, it would, you know move around and it would like pick up on your patterns and stuff and that, and that was really neat but the problem was it wasn't realistic at the same time was because you know if it back straight up you know and you went to step in it would like the sensor would be like no you're too close well what do I look like here you know <laughs> um, elastic man <laughs> yeah yep yeah, AI is not quite ready or boxing situations like that. Um, but anyway, um, 
we've uh, we've talked before about this big UFC deal with Reebok, and there's another story here about um, that deal is ending in 2021, and the UFC is going to be going with a company called Venom. Uh, and it was a $70 million deal with the with Reebok. Uh, that ends uh, March 2021. So that was a six-year deal. I don't know how many years this one's going to be, uh, but April 2021, we'll see UFC athletes debut Venom fight kits inside the Octagon. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Reebok may still become, will still be the UFC's footwear supplier, apparently. But uh, not the fight kits and the apparel. That's all going to Venom. And this was a, a, a deal that was done through uh, Endeavor's uh, parent company, IMG. They have a licensing business. Uh, so, interesting stuff. So they, they partnered with them to do that. And Venom. Not, not too familiar with the company itself. I've heard of it. I've seen it as a sponsor before, but uh, yeah. But basically, it's it's been around a little while. <coughs> not quite a Reebok level brand, but uh, obviously they have enough money to uh, pay for this deal. Let's see how much the fighters get out of it. Whether they get anything more than the Reebok deal, I doubt it. Uh, with the whole problem there with, uh, you know, fighters not being able to get their own sponsors. They gotta, they gotta go with Reebok on that deal. I don't know if this deal is going to be as restrictive, so perhaps the fighters will be able to, you know, have stuff on their kits other than Venom. Who knows? I don't know if it's going to be as exclusive as the Reebok deal, but anything is better than that hunk of crap. Austin Trout is in the news. Uh, he's got a legal battle going on with the World Boxing Organization. And uh, he's continuing the good fight in the courtroom after the Court of Appeals granted an appeal in his favor in the latest round of his $40 million lawsuit against the WBO. Uh, the ruling was handed down in the First Circuit Court of Appeals on Friday, and it was a 26 page opinion and order. 26 pages. Now that's a technical decision if I've ever heard of one. I don't think in all my cases I've ever had a 26 page opinion. Uh, but that sends it back to the trial court. Um, and trial's previous request for a review of the case was denied by that same court, thus underlining the significance of this latest development. The uh, opinion of the First Circuit afforded has afforded boxers the opportunity to be heard by a fair finder of fact and law. Uh, this decision should send a message everywhere in the boxing industry the Muhammad Ali Act will not bend to particular interests. Any and all boxers having a claim under the Muhammad Ali Act shall be heard by an impartial form. Uh, so he officially filed his lawsuit in November 2015. And that just goes to show you how slow the courts are. <laughs> Just a few months after uh, he was denied an opportunity to fight for the vacant WBO 154-pound title. Trout was ranked number four by the Puerto Rico-based sanctioning body at a time when the review process was ongoing to determine whether Demetrius Andrade should have been permitted to extend his largely inactive title reign. <coughs> Andrade was uh, stripped of the title on August 1st, 2015, following an unforgivable 14-month inactive stretch, which included his bailing from a planned December 2014 title defense versus Jermel Charlo. At the time of the WBO declaring the title vacant, Trout, who was consistently ranked number four, suddenly disappeared from the WBO top 15 altogether. For months, Trout remained ranked only behind Saul Canelo Alvarez, who was already angling towards a showdown with then lineal and WBC middleweight champion Miguel Cotto, Alexander Spirko and Francis M Michel Soro. Upon declaring Andre unfit to remain WBO 154-pound titleist, Trout should have been eligible to fight for the vacant crown versus Soro, given that Alvarez and Spirko were unavailable at the time. 
And the opportunity instead went to England's Liam Smith, who also previously fell prey to the ratings omission in June 2015 after having been ranked number five in May. The Brit was reinserted in the July ratings at number four, replacing Trout, whom was dropped altogether. Sorrow and Smith were promoted to number two and three, respectively, in August 2015, leaving them as the two highest-rated available contenders to fight for the vacant title. Sorrow was unavailable, as was Spearco, leaving Smith to face New Jersey's John Thompson, who, following his winning run in the ESPN2 Friday Night Fights Boxino tournament that May, entered the WBO 154-pound set in June at number five. His placement at the time was one spot below Trout, where he once again found himself in the, two, the September 2015 rankings when Trout was reinserted in his old position. So they basically played musical chairs with the rankings. Oh, just, I didn't realize it was this technical, but that's why you got a 26-page decision. Um, president of the WBO at the time claimed that Trout's commitment to a September 2015 class versus Joey Hernandez, which headlined the inaugural installment of PBC on FS1, was deemed as his being unavailable to fight for the title. Uh, so they're saying that when they, when it appeared that the title would become vacant, he had already signed for his next fight. So he could not fight for the vacant belt. So that's why they were removed from the rankings. But Trout never requested that he be restored, which is his right to do so, and Smith did request to be restored, and by our regulation, we matched Smith against the next champion of the division that was the champion of the NABL. So, both sides have their issues. That's why you have a trial. But the WBO, interestingly enough, says we are prevented by legal ethics from commenting on the Trout appellate decision since it is an active case pending legal action, even though Trout's lawyer has commented on it. <sighs> and uh, that's a commonly held misconception that lawyers aren't allowed to talk about shit in the press. Because, uh, I mean, if you remember any of the cases like... Uh, like this George Floyd one, you know, Trayvon Martin, all the, all the cases that were headline news, those lawyers for those defendants or plaintiffs or whatever they were in lawsuits or, you know, criminal cases, they were all on TV all the time if it was a big story. So if legal ethics really prevented you from going on the news, <laughs> then, you know, we wouldn't have all these lawyers on TV all the time, so... That's a, that's a misconception. But anyway, um, in the five years since the initial filing, Trout has only fought six times. Three of the six have come in bids for the IBF and WBC junior middleweight titles. <coughs> uh, so, let's fast forward to the end. His own lawyer, see, he, 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 this is him Quoting to the press, this is BoxingScene.com I'm reading from, said, This is indeed a great victory for Mr. Trout and boxing in general. However, there is still a very long road ahead in order to bring the Muhammad Ali Act to its full potential. We will do our share of the job by prosecuting this case until justice is done to Mr. Trout, whose claim exemplifies exactly why the Muhammad Ali Act was created in the first place. We are ready for the next round. How about that for a pun? So, yeah, that's an uh, interesting legal quandary. Uh, and here's a uh, combined MMA boxing story. Uh, come October, we might see uh, Mark Hunt coming back to action in the boxing ring. <coughs> Not in the cage. Uh, um, if you remember, uh, Mark Hunt, speaking of lawsuits, uh, sued the UFC unsuccessfully. It went quite a while, though, for, you know, normal battles with the UFC. They don't last very long. They have a pretty pretty uh, expansive legal team they can pick from, So, uh, and they have enough money to pay whatever lawyers they want to hire. So Mark Hunt um, made it pretty far, even though he didn't win. One claim 
stuck to the very end, and then they finally um, ruled that uh, he was not entitled to any relief. But uh, he hasn't competed since he exited from the UFC in December 2018, and uh, it was all the lawsuit was all based on Brock Lesnar testing positive for a performance enhancing drug pri- prior to the fight, and then they let him fight. Uh, so, you know, obviously there was. Uh, a claim that uh, you know, they put him in danger, number one, and, and number two, they uh, they gave him special treatment. Uh, so I thought he legitimately had a case, but you know how lawyers like to work. They, uh, they hide the truth whenever they possibly can, and obviously Hunt couldn't afford the best of the best, but uh, he hung in there. Anyway, um... The reason why the fight was allowed to continue was because Lesnar's tests was not test results were not returned until after the contest. Uh, it was originally a unanimous decision win for Rit Lesnar, but uh, oh, it says the lawsuit has been dismissed but is under appeal. I was not aware of that. That'll be interesting. Maybe we'll have a uh, another trout situation where he's victorious. Anyway. Uh, 2018 was the last time he fought. Uh, now he's getting ready to possibly fight a boxing match with rugby star Paul Gallen. G-A-L-L-E-N. He began boxing while still active in rugby, and he told Australia's 2GB Radio that he's agreed to a fight with Hunt in October. Uh, a follow-up report by MMA Fighting confirmed the matchup, was expected, which is expected to take place at the end of October, either the 30th or the 31st. So, Halloween, possibly. Prior to his MMA career, and at times alongside it, Hunt competed in kickboxing, finding considerable success. He also became a K-1 World Grand Prix champion. Uh, and he's, he does have an actual boxing record, too. Unfortunately, that record is 0-1-1. One one. <laughs> 20 years ago in Australia, though. That's not recent. <laughs> now he's 46 years old, looking to take on 38-year-old Gallon, who has compiled a boxing record of 9-0-1 oh, since his first pro fight in 2014. Five of those nine wins have come via KO, TKO. So maybe this is not such a good idea. <laughs> but, uh, hey... You know, if it uh, puts asses in seats or, well, puts people in front of computers these days. You can't have asses in seats without masks on, anyway. But, uh, yeah. And uh, we talked a little bit about the uh, the coronavirus and masks and all that. And um, we have some sad news for uh, UFC fighter uh, Nagamed or... Um, uh, Nurmagomedov, Khabib Nurmagomedov, his father, Abdul Manap, age 57, uh, had coronavirus, we knew, um, uh, a couple months ago, I think, but he obviously had one that lingered, uh, and he was, he was in the hospital since May, after he tested positive, and we've only heard about this in, like, certain groups of people, um, and it's it's odd because two of them I've heard about having these symptoms for more than a couple months work for CNN. <laughs> but uh, Chris Cuomo, you know, the governor's son or governor's brother uh, on CNN. He's, yeah, Fredo. Yeah, Fredo. Fredo. <laughs> so he is supposedly still suffering from uh, faint spells, like, you know, lack of energy, um, can't do the workouts he used to do, supposedly. And then there's the British guy, Richard Quest, who has symptoms like 100 days later, and and his doctors can't figure it out. And they've basically said that it's like a pendulum that's just swinging and swinging. Eventually it will stop, but we just don't know when. That's his doctor's reasoning (laughs) for why he still has the shit. But, uh, yeah, Khabib Nurmagomedov's father, 57 years old, obviously was involved in training with him and, you know, working with him. And so this is pretty devastating for him. Um, 
Ali Abdelaziz told ESPN on Friday, We've lost our backbone. He was a father, coach, brother, and icon. Things will never be the same without him. Um, but yeah, he was uh, basically over in Russia. He was like sports royalty. He earned the Master of Sports Recognition in Freestyle Wrestling as an elite athlete and the title of Honored Coach of Russia during his coaching career. Uh, and obviously we know why. Khabib is such a good wrestler uh, because of his influence, but uh, he also played the role, pivotal role in the lives of countless Russian fighters who made their way to the top in events around the globe, and his loss will be felt throughout the sporting world, according to a UFC statement. Uh, but even McGregor came out and said something nice. He said, uh, the loss of a father, a coach, and a dedicated supporter of the sport Condolences and rest in peace, Abdul Manap Nurmagomedov. Said that on Twitter. But, yeah. Sad reality. And let's go to Box Rec before we hit up the UFC results. So last week we had a couple Thursday fights. We had uh, the ones that are shown on here. It looks like they're overseas. Koki Inoue. Yeah, you know, and like, like I got to watch them on Thursday. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. The, um, I was watching, then you were starting to break out some of the names. Yep, uh, Koki Inoue losing to Daishi Nagata. So I'm guessing those guys are Japanese. And yeah, and the, and the, and the one fighter, um, in a way, um, no, I, I think he's like maybe from like Nigeria or Ghana, oh, okay. and he had just fought inside the bubble like two weeks ago and won. Hmm. Might be like nine days. Wow. Prior, might have fought the previous Tuesday. <laughs> nice. Uh, also on that card, we had Satoshi Shimizu. Beating Kaiohe Tonomoto. I'm guessing those guys better be both Japanese. Uh, Michaela, Michaela Meyer on Tuesday beating Helen Joseph in a female fight. Michaela was good, you know, and it was like the, one of the first times she, Al Mitchell had a Philadelphia with her uh, because um, Michaela had tested positive for COVID. Um, a couple weeks ago, and then Al Mitchell was quarantined, I think, back in Michigan. So, um, you know, he wasn't there with her, but he had talked to her before the fight, and and then, like, she did everything. I mean, she she won every round. She used her jab. She hit the body, you know, and then they were showing tonight, after the fight was over, uh, Michaela on the phone doing, like, a, um, I think it was just a straight phone call, and she, and she looks at camera and she points to her stomach and right as that she goes you would have stopped her if you would have went to the body <laughs> like almost that she, she knew that's exactly what he was going to say <laughs> and, and you know he was right because she dominated every round um but she did not you, you, you should not land many if any body shots and you know, the girl she was fighting was very tough that would have been a good way to maybe slowly break her down Uh, we also had Saturday fights. Uh, Steve Spark beating Michael Whitehead. Yu Pang over Tanawat Fonaku. Vladimir Hernandez over Aaron Coley. And a draw to Sean Webster and Samuel Clarkson on Saturday. And we had a few Friday night fights. Uh, Damian Wurzinski uh, beating Otto Gamez. Uh, Gomez, me. Also Friday, Brad Foster beating James Beach Jr. 
And Hamza Shiraz beating Paul Keane. And uh, I'm just looking at the front page. I don't have actual methods of that result or decision or knockout. But uh, we do have some fights coming up this weekend, too. Saturday. Saturday and Tuesday, we got a couple fights. Uh, Tuesday in Las Vegas at the Bubble, we got Oscar Valdez, 27 and 0, fighting Jason Velez, who is 29, 6 and 1 on ESPN. And then the co-main event is Edgar Berlanga, 13 and 0, fighting Eric Moon, who's 11 and 2. So you got a couple undefeated guys on the left side against some journeymen on the right. Two was really a journeyman. Anyway, those two losses have come in his last six too. Saturday night, what do we got going on Saturday. Uh, we got some stuff going on in Germany. This is probably a bad name for. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a male fighter, but I guarantee it's not pronounced the way it sounds. Because the first name is She, she Fat. She Fat is Sufi. <laughs> Shefet is probably how it sounds, but it's really pronounced. But it's spelled S H E F A T. She Fat U Sufi. He's a light heavyweight. Uh, 29, 4, and 2. Fighting Bosco Misik, who is 20 and 12 for the interim German international light heavyweight title. Uh, this is kind of a mismatch. Uh, middleweights Uenso Arik, who is 30 and 2, fighting Dustin Aman, who's only 4 and 1 for the interim German international middleweight title. Uh, you got a clear opponent here for the UBF European Super Middleweight title. Super Middleweights, Arben Shemilari, he's 7-0, and fighting Istvan Zeller, who's 38-29. and Wow, it's a tough one. <clears throat> All right, that's about it on that one. Decent one for the WBA Continental Heavyweight title, also in Germany on Saturday. Heavyweight Agit Caballel, 19-0, fighting Evgenios Lazaridis, who is 16-2. That's the only good fight on that card. Whoop, oh, Jesus fight of the week in Georgia. Uh, fights all over the place now, jeez. Um, Jesus Almonte in the main event. He's 8-2-2. Two and two. Fighting Leslie Michael Clacotta, who is three and five. So it looks like Jesus is set up for a win there. Uh, lightweights, Deontay Brown, nine and zero against Joey Sands, who's three one and one. It's a tough one. That's uh, a co-main event. Nothing much uh, in the rest of the card. Although there's a uh, there's a guy that uh, might be trying. To <laughs> to uh, feed off another name. His name is Gevonte Davis. <laughs> G-E-V-O-N-T-E. Of course, there's the other Tank Davis. Spells it a little different. <laughs> That's not the real one. Alright. We even have fights in China. China. Not worried about the coronavirus anymore, I guess. Uh... Chongqing, yeah. China, on Sunday. Wei Yu. That's what we're going to have to do before the fight. Wei Yu. <laughs> That's super lightweight. We're going to have to Wei Yu. We're going to have to Wei Yu, Wei Yu. <laughs> this guy's name is W E I. Well, one fighter tonight just decided not to get weighed. Oh, yeah? Uh, this guy's. Well, they said, and, and it was it's so funny because Max Kellerman usually like flips out when fighters like, don't make weight. Right. Because uh, he's had so many fights in his life. Had to make weight so many times, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, the Wolf Fighter, um, and of course, um, you know, I'm going to 
butcher the names, um, was supposed to fight uh, Shakur Stevenson a month ago. And, or he was supposed to fight Shakur Stevenson back in March. And then the fights got canceled because that's when everything started getting canceled with COVID. So he was going to fight guys like uh, Yep or something, John Yep or <laughs> something. And the fight was contracted for 127 pounds. So Yep, they said, was at the thing this morning at 10.30. The weigh-in was at 1.30 and he was 1.00. 28, but he said he wasn't feeling good, so he, maybe he said he was feeling dehydrated, and he just went and started eating and drinking and drinking water and energy drinks. So when he finally got on the scale, he was 137 and a half, <laughs> and like eight and a half pounds. And, and Max Kellerman was like, well, you know, yeah, usually, like, he flips out about this because it's disrespectful, but the fight got canceled, obviously. He goes, but in this situation, you know, because of the situation we're in right now with this whole COVID and all, all that you got a guy here that pretty much came out and said that he's here just uh, as soon as he gets hurt he's pretty much done right and he wasn't really going to put much of an effort in and so they're like you know the, why postpone it you know let the guys make their money but if the guy's not going to fight if the guy's not going to give an effort then why, why waste the time right well, there's some other funny names on here other than Wei Yu. Um, he's making his debut, by the way, Wei Yu. W-E-I-Y-U. That's his name. His name. Anyway, he's fighting Zen Yu Yang, also making his debut. And then we got the co-main event. A couple good names here. Okay, first you got flyweights in here. Jung Ki. He's a Jung Ki fighter. <laughs> J-U-N... QI, that's his name. One one and oh. He's fighting a guy who spells his name first name A G E. Age. Last name H E He. A G. I don't know how old he is, so you better age he. <laughs> uh, and then that's not even the, the best one here. Um, <clears throat> when you have to go to court against somebody, you sue. <laughs> Why you sue? Why you S U? Why you first name S U last name? You sue. <clears throat> and if it's a guy, boy, he's probably gonna be like uh, a boy named Sue is gonna be his favorite song. <laughs> Johnny Cash. He's fighting Young Zhu in his debut. They're both having their debut at Featherweight. You sue. That's it. Uh, da -da -da. So that's it for upcoming boxing, past week's boxing. Now we got to go to UFC. Uh, by the way, Bellator is coming back next week. So we'll have that to talk about. Uh, one championship is also starting to come back shortly. I, don't, I think the end of July is their schedule. But anyway, uh, last night I, I watched a little bit of the fights. I didn't get to uh, stay awake for the main event. But I uh, watched Jimmy Rivera and Cody Stammen right before I fell asleep. And a uh, little bit of the Molly McCann fight against uh, Talia Santos. Uh, I still can't get over Molly McCann being nicknamed the Meatball. And wanting to be called the Meatball. It's like, uh, did you grow up with other females? <laughs> Most females I know would be offended by that. <laughs> uh, anyway, she lost a unanimous decision. Um, well, it was a pretty good fight. Uh, for that, we had Munir Lazez beating Abdul Razak Al Hassan. Uh, that was kind of a sloppy, all over the place fight. <coughs> uh, but uh, very interesting. That went three rounds. I did catch the end of that. And then we had uh, Kamzat Chimeyev beating John Phillips by Brabo Choke. One minute and 12 seconds into the second round. Leron Murphy beating Ricardo Ramos by knockout. Four minutes and 18 seconds into the fight. Then we got Modestas Bukowskis beating Andreas Michalides by TKO. Elbows must have quit at the end of the round because it says five minutes at the end of round one. <coughs> so it must have been uh, late, late 
barrage of elbows. Jared Gordon beating Chris Fishgold by unanimous decision in the third fight of the night. Liana Jojua beating Diana Belbita by armbar. Two minutes and 47 seconds into their fight. And then we had Jack Shore against Aaron Phillips. Jack Shore winning by rear naked choke. Two minutes and 29 seconds into the second round. The co-main event, we had Tim Elliott beating Ryan Benoit by unanimous decision. Uh, and then the main event, Calvin Qatar, the Boston finisher. Didn't quite get the finish, but uh, improved to 22-4 and four against uh, Dan Ige, who falls to 14-3. and three. And uh, hits like a ton of bricks, but uh, just couldn't do enough in this uh, five-round affair to get the unanimous decision that went to uh, Calvin. And uh, I'm kind of sorry I missed that, because he's, uh, he's one of those guys I've been following, and, and uh, he's been contributing to our site. Um, since like 2004, no, 2006 or 2007, I think, uh, was when I got my first email from him. <coughs> but yeah, headquartered out of Lawrence there, and uh, used to talk a lot. But now he's in the big time. <coughs> we never interviewed him though, so we got to get him on the show. Uh, then we had uh, UFC 251 on the debut of Fight Island. And uh, we had a couple co-main events that were very controversial. Um, of course, I gave up watching when the Peter Yan fight and the Jose Peter Yan versus Jose Aldo fight um, went to the fourth round. So I got through the fourth round, and the feed just kept crashing and crashing and crashing and crashing. And so, of course, I didn't get to see the end of the fight where Jose gets crushed in round five. But I could see the writing on the wall. I mean, I could see him slowing down. I could see that uh, Peter was very patient. He had a great chin. He was taking everything that was given and uh, definitely lived up to the billing and the uh, expectations of the bookies because he was the favorite, and uh, he showed it. TKO'd him in round five. And then uh, probably the one I had the most fun watching was the Rose Namahunas versus Jessica Andraj fight. And Rose looked fabulous the first two rounds. She was zipping the jab out there. She was connecting every now and then with that straight right. Uh, and, and she would loop that right hook in every now and then. And just very smart fighting, very uh, good use of the ring, the cage. Uh almost running at a couple points you know, to get that distance that she needed. Uh, but Jessica just fought that head down, move forward, uh, don't ask any questions, just punch. And it didn't work out for her the first couple rounds, but the third round was a little different story. Uh, you wouldn't even have thought that uh, Rose had a, had a fight that night if it wasn't for round three. <laughs> Round two, she'd come back to the corner looking good, but uh, at the end of the fight, her nose was hanging off her face, and she had a big old black eye. I don't know what what uh, cut the nose. I don't know if it was a punch or an elbow. Um, I didn't catch any replay that showed that, but uh, her nose was split wide open at the end of the third round, and then uh, she had a big, puffy black eye. I think it all happened in that round. So, obviously, uh, you know, couple judges saw one of those rounds for, uh, or at least one judge, saw one of those rounds for Rose, or for Jessica, one of those other rounds, not just the third, because it was a split decision, um, and I think Jessica got one judge, and Rose got the other two, but yeah, maybe we'll see a third fight now, but uh, probably not anytime soon for Rose, because she wants to take a break. <laughs> find out about her, her eye and her, her nose. Uh, before that, we had Amanda Rebus beating uh, Paige Van Zant by armbar submission. Two minutes and 21 seconds into the fight. And Dana White um, says he likes her, but uh, she's not UFC material anymore. Uh, basically, he said uh, she sucks. <laughs> she should go back to the, the feeder league. That's the open market. That's yeah. the open market. Yep. So he's not too hyped up on her anymore. 
But then again, you know, she has come out and said that she makes more money on Instagram than she does fighting, so... Maybe that's, that's a reflection of how hard she's training. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so she might be out for a little while. Or, uh, who knows, she might just decide to just dominate one of those feeder leagues and then still do her Instagram. Come back one day. But uh, for now, she might be done. Eighth fight of the night, we had Jerry Prochazka over Volkan Ozdemir. By knockout from a punch, 49 seconds into round two. And Muslim Salikov over Elijah Zaleski Dos Santos by a split decision. Uh, Makwan Amir Khani over Danny Henry by technical submission from an anaconda choke, 3 minutes and 15 seconds in. Leonardo Santos fighting, uh, getting a unanimous decision win over Roman. Bogatov and Marcin Tibura over Maxim Grishin by unanimous decision. All these early ones were unanimous decisions. Raulian Peva over Zalgas Zumagulov by unanimous decision and female fight. Carol Rosa over Vanessa Milo by unanimous decision. And then uh, Davy Grant beating Martin Day with a Late knockout, third round, two minutes and 38 seconds from a punch. And then we have the controversy. Uh, Alexander Volkanovsky, uh, rematching uh, Max Holloway, uh, took the belt from him in the last fight. This one uh, it was a split decision, so there was a very close result, uh, which would reflect a very close fight usually, but... Um, Whatever judge ruled it for Holloway, Dana thought it should be uh, more than one, but uh, I guess it was just one. So Volkanovski got the nod. But uh, Dana White was convinced that Holloway did enough to get the victory, along with a lot of other fighters that uh, commented. But, uh, you know, judges were not always in the best position to see the the action, number one. And uh, even though now that they do, they are confirmed to have... Uh, video monitors they can use still doesn't uh, give them all the very same picture of the fight so and then you have other situations where <coughs> um, people come in from boxing to do the scoring and they're not maybe familiar with mixed martial arts and how that scoring works or people come in without any experience in any fight <laughs> I don't know sometimes it just seems like these people just don't know what they're doing I didn't see the fight, so I can't really weigh in on this, but uh, what, did, what did you think about the Volkanovski? Yeah, Rich, uh, I, I wouldn't say, uh, I mean, uh, put it this way, I wouldn't use the word robbery. Yeah. Uh, I had Max up three to two, but to be fair, um, three or, you know, three, maybe even four of those rounds were a toss-up, fairly close, and um, that's where it goes. Okay. I mean, uh, like I said, I, I certainly have seen a lot worse. Yeah. Well, we talked about it, too. Uh, he's just horrible with defense, Holloway. And, uh, you know, I bet you that was probably the reason why he didn't win all three rounds was because he got hit too much. Uh, and judges thought that was the difference, obviously. But I'll have to go back and watch it so I can really talk knowledgeably about it. Uh, for now, I can just say that... Uh, we pretty much predicted how that one would go. Uh, anyway. We also had uh, the main event, of course, go exactly the way we pretty much said it would. Uh, <clears throat> Masvidal would have to come out early and get the knockout if he was going to win. That didn't happen. Uh, Uzman basically did what he did to Woodley. He just weathered the storm and put the hurt on him over the course of a whole four, five round fight. And, and Masvidal is probably in the position here, like kind of like Conor McGregor against Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> All he had to do was show that he could get through five rounds and compete with a champion. Uh, he didn't have to win the fight. I mean, he's on short notice. He didn't get the full training camp for Usman. Uh, so this was literally, any way you look at it, either a tune-up fight for him or a complete upset if he was going to get the win. 
<clears throat> so he made a game of it. I mean, he definitely hung in there. It, it, it wasn't enough to get uh, uh, any kind of def- nod from any judge. All five rounds, I guess, the unanimous decision went to Kamara Uzman. I don't know about all five rounds, but maybe Masvidal won a couple. But yeah, I, I think I think Masvidal won the first round. But I wouldn't call it weathering the storm. It was, um, from my perspective, one of the worst hours of my life. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, someone made the comment on the underground, none of these MMA guys should complain that boxers make a lot more money at uh-huh. the highest level, because we've, we've all seen bad, you know, we've, we've seen boxing matches that haven't lived up to their billing, Right. Yeah. but when MMA is bad, it's bad. <laughs> this, this was, I, I can't even describe this, I mean, not even a lay and pray, I mean, it was like a a wall installed more than a lay-in prey because the wall was hard to take down. And it was just a, just doing nothing. Huh? And I mean, here's the thing that, that from Usman's standpoint, yeah, uh, he kept his belt. What he, I mean, here's the guy coming in on six days and he couldn't finish him? Yeah. <laughs> or it couldn't even, it didn't even seem like he was just going for it. I mean, just because the fight's on the ground doesn't, I mean, it was, it was smart that he didn't trade punches with Masvidal, but just because the fight's on the ground doesn't mean it has to be boring. Maybe he's getting paid by the hour. Oh, so now the U.S. is <laughs> not going right. <laughs> yeah, and, and so now, when you think of the, and plus, you know, uh, Usman's got the personality of, uh, it, it's just, they've got a problem here. They're going to have to stack, any defense he makes, they're going to have to stack the card with, with something else because, I mean, this guy's just, he's got no fan base, he's got no charisma, and there's no excitement. I mean, it was, it's just terrible. Hmm. And the thing is, he's got that kind of a style. It would be like watching Floyd Mayweather fight a guy that really didn't have a good punch. And you've got to sit through 12 rounds of that, <laughs> knowing in advance. Or, or, or what if they said, well, all of a sudden, now we're going we're gonna to double it. It's 24 rounds. So imagine what a student's best that would have been. This thing could have went for 10 rounds, it would have been in nightmare so uh, it, it's it's just well enough I guess I, I think is, um, I really feel someday this is how my one friend I'm looking at his Facebook post right now these were his uh, two descriptions I have never I have literally never been so bored watching a UFC fight this is <laughs> and then and then need proof that the UFC is fixed and complete bullshit why that last fight disgusted. He got his ass beat like a rented mule, but he won. Ridiculous. <laughs> well, speaking of um, getting your ass beat and so winning, there was a fight. Uh, I almost forgot about this one. That actually reminded me of a, a story that uh, you guys might have missed, but uh, I caught it this week. It was uh, Boston Salmon. We made fun of his name. And he was on the UFC, a couple UFC cards, and he didn't even have a picture. Uh, I like it. So, Boston Salmon, I think he was like, he went like two total rounds in the UFC. He got, he got two opportunities, and he flopped both times. So, this time, he was in a feeder league somewhere, and he got hit by a flying knee after he had been uh, put on the ground by punches. Uh so he was just getting up off the ground, still had a hand on the ground, and the guy came over with a flying knee and smashed his head into the cage and knocked him right the hell out. I mean, he was out cold. So he got the win because the guy was disqualified. <laughs> but, yeah, look that up. It's a crazy video. Oh, man. You, it's one of those ones where you watch it and you go, Oh, <laughs> that hurt. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Not a way to get a, a good win in my book. That's that's a shitty way to get a win. Ugh. But anyway, uh, we have Bellator 242 coming up next weekend, uh, next Friday, I believe, this 24th. The Mohegan Sun Arena, so Connecticut, uh, opening their casinos up to fights again. Very interesting. Uh, Ricky Bandejas in the main event, 13 and three. Against 19 and 5, Sergio Pettis, and a former guest on our show. Way back when he was a little bitty prospect before he even went to the UFC to follow his brother's footsteps there. 
uh, Sergio was, was on the show. Now he's in main event of Bellator here on their comeback card. <coughs> Jordan Main is the co-main event co-star here with uh, Jason Jackson. Jordan is 31 and 12. Jackson is 11 and 4. And we got Taiwan Claxton, 6 and 1, fighting J.J. Wilson, who's 5 and 0. And then the the, uh, the heavily hyped phenom Aaron Pico, with a, a mediocre record of five and three, who was expected to be eight and zero oh by now, uh, had a couple of mishaps so far in his stellar career. But when he is on, you got to admit he's on. He is on fire, basically. But uh, yeah, he, he makes some mistakes here and there, and he pays for them. Anyway, his opponent is Chris Hatley Jr., who is eight and two. So formidable on paper record at least there I don't know if I've ever seen him fight uh, doesn't, doesn't ring a bell anyway third fight of the night Jake Smith 7-3 and three, fighting Mark Leminger who is 10-1 and one. and then Ralphion Stotts 13-1 and one against Cass Bell undefeated at 5-0 and oh. first fight of the night Steve Mowry 7-0 and oh against Rudy Shafroth who is 6-1 do believe that's about it for what we have. Covered two weeks pretty quickly. <laughs> that's what happens in COVID times. Yeah, right. It's funny, it's like, you know, Ring Magazine, you know, they're still trying to, you know, you know, make business, make some publications, you know. I mean, especially for people that are, you know, yearly subscriptions like I am. So they're almost alternating their issues. You know, do they do an issue like every three or so weeks? So like alternating your issues. So like uh, issue could be like you know fight news. Hey, you know still talking about this potential fight. Mostly it's for the last issue was talking about uh, what we could be seeing and how we're gonna you know operate in a COVID world. You know things like that. Um, now they'll hopefully have some improve, like some results with you know fights happening now in the last few weeks. But then the other issues are um, like almost a collaborative issues. Like the one was the um, whole issue on the Gotti Ward trilogy. You know, talking about their careers separate, you know, um, their, their life, their legacy. Um, and then, then they have a breakdown of each, each of the three fights. And then... Um, then they have one on the Fab Four, Leonard, Hagler, Hearns, Durant. And I just got one uh, two days ago. It's a, um, it's like a Mike Tyson breakdown. Wow. Hey, they're doing something, right? Uh, also, before I forget, um, the, uh, the Clash of Legends. The fight with Pat Militich and Michael Nunn. I believe it's a kickboxing, kickboxing setup. Um, yeah. that's happening this weekend. That's on. So it has not been canceled. <clears throat> but, yeah. Um, ESPN has had to do a lot of different things, too, Tony, with uh, their content. And somehow they've been able to keep going with no new rounds of layoffs or anything. Yeah. So, yeah, so you got to be creative these days. You, you really do. You really, really do. Um, I, um... It was funny, I was um, at work yesterday, well, I was in my kitchen, a.k.a. <laughs> at work yesterday, okay? and it was my seven-year anniversary with the company, and there's only two people from my training class that are outside for me that are still with the family of companies, we call it. Um, one girl, she still works in my department, but she's on maternity leave, and the other guy, he ended up moving over to our parent company, but we're all still in the same, you know, email um, server. So I wanted to send him an instant message saying, hey man, happy seven year anniversary. He comes back with, you too, Mr. NBC Sports. And I'm like, you see my commercial? He's like, since I've been working from home, I have on um, the one local Comcast uh, sports channel in Philadelphia, which I haven't really been watching, um, but he goes, I see your commercial three times a day, minimum. I'm like, 
I, I should be getting royalties from that, man. I got a nickel for every time that play played. I have a couple hundred bucks at least. Right. Oh, Red, I see I see your boy just signed up for Cammy, you know, this week. Who's that? You, you know you know the Cameo website, right? Yeah. Who's my boy? Your boy Vinny Pat. Oh, <laughs> That's your boy. Somebody apparently, somebody apparently made a um, a fake Instagram account under his name. <laughs> well, did you hear about the all the guys that got hacked on Twitter the other day? No. Oh, Bill Gates and that was yesterday. E- e- yeah, Elon Musk, uh, a bunch of powerful billionaires, I guess, all got their accounts hacked, and they put out some scam for Bitcoin. <laughs> They, they put out some scam trying to get people to uh, do Bitcoin or something. I don't know. Uh, yeah, get into the security, and, and then I'll, I'll match your contribution. Yeah. Yeah, that was... Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was, funny. It, was, it was funny, guys. You'll appreciate this. Um, I had a, a, a guy that I've known since second grade. Um, he brought his son over last week to do some, some training with me, and it's going to be a challenge. You know, the kid very unathletic. But you know what? You want to give him a little confidence in himself. So I was working with him, and I was talking to his father, like I said, who I've grown up with. And um, he is a um, police officer in the suburbs. But where he lives is in the township where my other trainee, Matt, is a police officer. So they know each other. And um, we were talking, you know, about people that are scammers and this and that and what Matt would do is he was a lot of times he would get older people that would call because they were getting these phone calls like about their credit card you know being stolen or a car warranty you know all, all the scam so so Matt would get on the line and he would he would taunt them you know and he would you know say some things like to really get their ire hmm. which I thought was funny but then I was like, no, I'm, I mean, you know what I might start doing? I might get a whistle. The loudest, shrillest, worst type of whistle you can get. And you get these scammers on the phone and then just blast into their ear. Wow. I think that'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, call a police, I'll call a police officer that I'm going to do this. <laughs> uh, well, there's going to be, uh, this is an interesting story. In August, Eddie Hearn is making his USA debut, or return, I should say, August 15th. And they're going to go to the streets for this, kind of like uh, how the USA Wrestling Program did a uh, thing expo in uh, New York City's Times Square a few times. Uh, these people are, are going to be doing it, uh, Eddie Hearn's company, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They're going to block streets off from 4th and 6th at the intersection of South Boston Avenue. No fans will be present. There will be strict social distancing and medical protocols in place and a ring placed in the middle of the street to set a stunning stage for what promises to be an explosive night of action, says Hearn. Uh, he Previously cool. confirmed plans to stage bouts in the Matchroom HQ back back garden in the UK starting from August 1st. So, yeah, it sounds like a cool idea as far as the backdrop, but yeah, it would be even better if they had You know, you, you, you wonder though about this, this, this lack of fans. Yeah. Someone brought up a good point. The, the crowd is like the fourth wall. Yeah. It's like the fourth wall. Yeah. It's like the fourth wall. Yeah. It's 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 the Maybe wouldn't have been as bad. I mean, the results probably would have been the same. But if there had been thousands of people booing, maybe the referee would have been more aggressive about telling who's been stopped to hug. Him. Yeah. Or if you're going to hug, do do something. Do right. something besides what you're doing. And the fact that there's no crowd to keep the referee in check may really mean that. It, it definitely plays a factor, and I hadn't, I hadn't really thought of that, but I think that's a good point. Well, yeah, because it's in the city, 
Maybe there'll you be know, people in the buildings yelling down. If they can't be I mean, on the I street, know what some maybe. Of the started yelling, and obviously that's a predetermined, you know, event. But for a while, they were having like guys come out to completely empty, completely empty studio. You know, and you know, and, and especially in professional wrestling, but you come out to make this grand entrance, and you're supposed to be feeding off the crowd. You're supposed to be taunting the crowd. And it was really awkward. So what they started doing was having a lot of their developmental wrestlers filling in, in like, the crowd area. And they're behind plexiglass, that's fine. But at least to give the performers something to work off of. Um, along the same lines, uh, talking about, you know, there's no fan, you know, that my wonderful city, Philadelphia, which is really, the whole state of Pennsylvania has really gotten bad, especially with this garbage governor that we have and <laughs> I hate to be mean and I hate to be nasty and I hate to make fun of a per- person's personal defect but he was one of the ones that him and this doctor that is used to his main doctor in charge of the health of Pennsylvania is a child psychiatrist so this doctor is making decisions on you know caring for an infectious disease um, you know pandemic who doesn't have this experience? And this, and, I, and I'll call her a her, but it's really a man, not a woman. Um, started. No, it says you don't, don't misgender me. Don't misgender me. Remember that press conference, Tony? Yeah. When yeah. someone said, "Hello, sir," don't misgender me. What yeah. a preacher. Well, so you go ahead and be me. Be me as be as mean as you want. Yeah. Well, what they did was this doctor and this governor started forcing nursing homes, our most vulnerable population, to take these people, these COVID patients. So, of course, they spread like wildfire there. You have a lot of these people that, you know, especially where my one aunt stays, she's severely dementia, and her family can't visit her. She's severely dementia. She doesn't know that she has to stay in her room. She gets up and she she, she goes out and wanders in the social area. You know, she gets it. She's gone. So that's one thing. But then this other, this piece of shit governor said there, no, you can't have this. Bars can't be open. Restaurants can't be open. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. You can't go. You can't go to church. You can't do this. You can't do that. And then he's out there walking arm in arm with protesters. And someone's like, oh, but hmm. that's okay. Well, yeah, well, uh, and protest, that's, 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 that's different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's freedom. It's freedom of speech. Because then they came out and said, in this city of Philadelphia, everything is canceled through February. Through February, we're in July. Let me remind you that. We're in July. Everything is canceled until February 28th. No large gatherings whatsoever. There will be no um, parade. Thanksgiving Day Parade? No. Mummer's Parade, which is the public staple? No. Eagles games? No fans, which the Eagles are now trying to fight saying it's a private property. Hmm. Um, so that, I don't know what's going to happen there. But everything is no, you can't have the protests are still okay. Yeah. And then, and then Tony, yeah, and, and then, Tony, don't forget that that thing that is the health director of Pennsylvania, that thing's mother, would not have to abide by that thing's edict about that. Exactly. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, just, it's, it's beyond belief. It, it, it's yeah, that, 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 that person's mother was taken out of That's her and put to a private hotel. So, you know, some of the time double standards. Yeah. That's so here's yeah, the funny that, thing. And like I said, to, uh, um, this governor, who I think is a piece of shit, and the mayor of Philadelphia, you know, I would love to throw out of a building because he's just garbage. His DA is garbage. How about, you, how about you the know, DA of Philadelphia? How about yeah. the DA of Philadelphia? Ask the companies about that. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, we, oh, I know. I know. In, in fact, you know, if, if I can um, paraphrase a gentleman that you and I have discussed many times, you're a crumb. You're a crumb. <laughs> <on the couch. laughs> you know, I'll, I'll take all four of you on. This crumb. But, you know, it's like, I'm looking at this guy, Wolf, and, you know, he said, that you have to wear a mask. You, tell them, you can't sit down for a meal. You can't do this. You can't do that. And then a month ago, or maybe six weeks ago, right around Memorial Day, they show him walking arm in arm 
who interlocked arms with protesters. And someone came out and called me, like, oh, maybe, well, maybe that wasn't, oh, maybe, okay, maybe I shouldn't have done that. And he's like stuttering over himself. But the best part about it, the best part about it was he got the worst sunburn on that ball head. <laughs> and I was like, right in that, I would love to get some sandpaper. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Someone said something about him today. It was actually a fellow from Lock Haven Box who was after me but you know uh, we're still friends and we always BS and I'm like dude I would love to use that guy's he- head as a heavy bag right now <laughs> nice alrighty then oh. we're gonna wrap it up for the night until next week I I, don't, I know that there's right, probably well, an, another well, UFC we'll fight we didn't uh, we didn't preview but we'll just uh, we'll just do the results next week we're not going to do any predictions. Because Box, I mean, Bellator, uh, Sure Dog is, for some reason, not even putting events on their page, even though these events were listed like two weeks ago. Uh, for, for some reason, they don't list any events on their page anymore. So, I did not chalk that up. But I, I'm pretty sure there's one this Saturday, right? Tom? UFC? Uh. You know, they're coming so quick. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I, I haven't really seen anything. Maybe it's next week. Maybe we um, lucked out. Anyway, uh, I'm also going to send you guys I, I think we may have a link off on this. to a New York Post article that you'll appreciate about uh, rats in a boxing match in a subway station and the cat as the referee. <laughs> True story. It's on video. As if 2020 isn't weird enough. All right, until next week. Okay, guys. Thanks for stopping by.